This video is sponsored by Squarespace. It is officially spring on the farm because we have lots of flowers. I'm actually a little nervous that so many of our daffodils are blooming. Uh, it has been insane weather so far this year. We've had record breaking heat. It's only the beginning of April and these I didn't want to bloom still for another two weeks. So we're enjoying them. I hope you all enjoy them, but we're not going to be selling as many of these as we hoped. Last fall, we planted an additional 3,000 daffodils onto the farm, which means in total, we have 6,000 planted. So even though there's probably currently about 1,000 blooming now, we're still going to have lots and lots that we're going to be able to try to sell. And this is just the very first thing that blooms on the farm. This is just the beginning. And in the same way that these have woken up super early, I actually have a lot that I can share with you. We have about 15,000 tulips on the farm that are getting really close to blooming, but I'm gonna tease you. I'm gonna save it for the end. The first thing we're gonna start with is the peonies that we planted last fall. In the fall, we had $10,000 worth of peonies show up. We'd spent most of the year prepping for it because it was a pretty big job. It was about a thousand plants and it took up a huge amount of space on the farm. It made me nervous. That was a lot of money, a lot of work, and I've been waiting all winter to see what's gonna happen. And what happened is they're growing amazingly. We have 14 beds planted in total. Just be very excited for what peony season's gonna look like. And here, this is one of our latest um, varieties. This one is only just popped up. It is making me nervous, but here today looking at it, you know, there's four or five like sp little sprouts coming up in almost every single one of these holes. And you should see some of the earliest varieties. Some of the earliest to pop up varieties were my coral varieties. We have three separate uh, different coral colored ones. These ones are coral sunset and this already has a bud on it. It's leafed out, it has buds. I'm, I'm really, really excited. You know, when you do a project this big, this is something that we worked on for like almost three years, getting this whole area ready. We took down trees, we tilled and years and years of work. We spent many, many days digging holes in the cold and the wet. Um, you get like a lot of excitement and a lot of nerves, a lot of feelings. So to see these coming up, see these actually doing what the plan was all along. Um, I'm just, I'm, re I'm really excited to see what's gonna happen. And as exciting as the peonies we planted in the fall are, my mind is just being blown by these second year peonies. It's incredible how much larger these plants are after being in place for only one year. The rule kind of when you're when you're flower farming peony plants is you really shouldn't pick any flowers off them for the first three years so they can get nice and established, nice big plants. Peonies can live for over a hundred years as long as you treat them kindly. Um, so to see them this happy, this healthy on year two, it's, you know, it's incredible to think what they'll look like in five years. In the spring, nothing ever looks as exciting as it's going to look because all the plants are still really tiny. But this is a space that I'm really pumped about. This is our Lysianthus tunnel where you have two full beds of Lysianthus. I think in total, I'm gonna have something like 5,000 Lysianthus planted in here. I've already put in about 3,000 and I have a few trays that I need to get working on to finish filling up the bits and pieces. And then along the middle, I have Campanula and Stock. Um, I'm hoping that these will bloom, look nice for the late spring, and then I can take them out, have lots of space to work with the Lysianthus as we go into the summer. Lysianthus was such a hit 
for us last year. We had some incredible varieties and I feel like I learned a lot. One of the things that I think I made a mistake on with the Lysianthus last year is I didn't give them enough water in the early days. And because of that, they, they just didn't get established. They didn't get rooted in as fast as I would have liked. So this year we're watering a lot more. We're seeing how that works out. Um, there is a little bit of disease in here. Lysianthus is very, very susceptible to fusarium for funguses and rot and things like that. So I am losing some plants, maybe because it's, it's more wet, it's less dry, but what is surviving looks like it's thriving really well. So I'm fingers crossed, long, beautiful stems. And then our second tunnel here, which isn't looking quite as exciting as I would have hoped, is planted up. Both of the outside beds have ranunculus in them. And I don't know, I had issues with my ranunculus sprouting this year. Um, so I have a lot planted, they were rooted. I'm like, any day now, they should start popping up. Fingers crossed. And then in the middle bed, I have a bunch of anemones planted in. So I'm hoping a month from now, two months from now, this is gonna be lush, it's gonna be blooming, it's gonna be beautiful. Um, but right now, you know, still, still looks kind of spring-like in here. But that isn't the only ranunculus I have this year. I have a huge ranunculus surprise. This is the spot where we had a greenhouse up last year where a dust devil thing came and ripped it out of the ground, <laughs> destroyed it. I'll put a link to the video up. Um, but we had our ranunculus in here and because of the whole chaos of what happened, it never got never got picked up in the summer when they went dormant. In the fall, they started to grow again and they actually overwintered. We put down a little bit of straw to try to help, but we had enough snow. This wasn't covered all winter. We are a zone five here. And yeah, we, we have overwintered ranunculus, which I'm really excited. The, about half of them got eaten by mice. So there, you know, it's not like there's a thousand here, but I wouldn't be surprised if we end up having a couple hundred plants and these are a lot further along than the ones that are even in the greenhouse. One of the things about the spring is it's kind of like a waiting game, right? With those ranunculus, I never hold my breath that anything is gonna survive the winter. And so this time of year, things are just starting to wake up. Things are just starting to grow again. And I never know what I'm gonna have for the year. So as I go around and I look at all my perennials, I try to be patient, um, but as of this week, I think pretty much most of them I've seen wake up. And so I'm, I'm really excited. I don't think we lost very much this winter and some of our new perennials are looking like they're gonna be really good successes. I love yarrow. Every year I'm like, it's enough. We don't need any more yarrow. And then I grow just a little bit more. So last year I was missing some of the pinks. I was like, I want more pink yarrow. So I grew a couple trays of summer berries and they got planted out quite late. And you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really expecting too much from them, but these plants have been growing like crazy. They haven't had water at all. They're just very happy, very healthy in this spot. And it's exciting by having yarrow kind of spread all over the farm stuff like this can create like a succession, right? So I know that these are gonna bloom a lot l earlier than some of my other varieties, which means I'll have even more weeks of Euro, which just makes me happy. This is another perennial that I was doing a little test on. This is Echinops and then a little bit of Fama scabiosa. And so I don't have too many of these, but I'm really happy to see how well it overwintered, how healthy these plants look. And I do have a couple hundred more seeds. So this is something that I might consider doing again this year. You know, come the summer, I can grow some trays when I have a little bit more time. I can plant them out in the fall and I can slowly start to establish this entire bed into an Echinops bed if I want. But the one I think I'm the most excited that is new for this year is my Anise Hyssop bed. I picked off this for months. I used it as my base greenery for so many things. I really, really like this. 
The only problem is it's inconsistently perennial for me. Usually about half of the plants will die off. In the past, I've only ever had a small patch. So I was like, that's it. I'm putting in hundreds. I think this bed has like 600 <laughs> anise hyssop plants. I was really worried about this. This was not growing at all. <laughs> Everything else was kind of coming up and this was still dead sticks. I was like, maybe, maybe I lost them all. Maybe this is something that I have to replant every single year. And then I went to sleep and I woke up and it was like exploded. Honestly, at this point, I think my survival rate on this bed is looking in at like 85%, which is just incredible for for me and and growing this and there was so many seeds that dropped in this area last year that i'm not going to be surprised if even where i have empty empty holes that i don't have to plant myself they're just going to have self-seeded and come back on their own we've been doing a lot of work getting the farm back in back in order uh prepped up for the new season we don't have any seeds in yet but i probably I probably should do it this week. Um, and yet again, more of those perennials are back. I'm excited to see them growing. We have two beds of lilies. This is a great one for actually seeing what's happening because uh, we got some grass out of there. So this, this is just perennialized lilies. A couple years ago, I planted lilies into this bed. We have the irrigation lines that run along here. So it makes it a little tricky to till in here. So these, just every year, they come back. And we have about a four week window of when lilies bloom for us because we have Asiatic and Oriental lilies that kind of stagger and the different colors kind of bloom one after another. Lilies can be really, really popular. We find that for our customers, they're kind of give or take. Some people really love them, but a lot of people aren't really interested in them at all. So by only having a short lily season, you know, it makes a little little bit of excitement um, and then, then they're gone. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see them still coming back because I've been picking so aggressively off here. Every year I wonder, am, am I still gonna be able to get a cut stem or am I, you know, knocking back the plant permanently by cutting so much? Um, and you know with the early varieties that are up at least it's looking like it, they are working really well as something that can be cut every single year. In here is another perennial bed and there's not very much going on here. This is a bunch of feverfew, I have some rubecchia, a few bits and pieces. This was a really dry winter. We're currently in like some pretty extreme drought conditions and this is a good example of how it's affecting us on the farm. Um, we don't have water yet. We usually don't get our water turned on until mid-April, sometimes even later in April. So it's very difficult to water these plants. Um, it's very, very dry in, in Kelowna. So, um, well, it seems obvious that things should be fine for water over the winter. Um, it's just, it's not always the case for us. And so, I, I think we're gonna have some pretty significant losses on our fever few this year. Usually we get a 50% survival rate. Um, I don't know, with, with the dry, it might only be 25%. This is one of our big, large main perennial beds. Over the last two years, we've been working on filling this up, filling this in. And the great thing about perennials is, you know, the first year maybe you get a cut, the second year they're doing okay, but third year they really, they really show themselves. And so as this whole area, even though it doesn't really look like anything right now, establishes itself, we're gonna get more and more and more production without it taking up more space. So I have a bunch of yarrows in here. I have like some beautiful yellow yarrow, terracotta yarrow, which is one of my favorites. We have a couple beds of phlox, which we just absolutely loved this this last this last early summer. So I'm <laughs> I'm really excited to see even more of it coming in. I have some scabiosas along here. I have some uh, white glitter and blue glitter uringium sea hollies. I have some bee balms. I have a whole mix, and it survived. It survived the winter. It's back. I'm I'm very happy and. We also have a new addition to this area. 
we put in a full bed of daffodils. This is where about, I don't know, 1,200 of the 3,000 daffodils that we put in are and they're looking very healthy, very happy. Um, I think they're enjoying this spot even more than along the fence line. So I'm excited. I'm excited about what we're gonna be picking out of here. And I was really picky about varieties. I picked all the latest blooming, tallest blooming varieties from what we've experimented with on the farm over the last couple of years. So I think that we're gonna have lots of sellable stems, which is the goal. We are a flower farm after all. And then, my last perennial section up here. Uh, I have two full beds of yarrow. It's coming back really strong. A full bed of sedum, which, you know, I'm surprised how much is there because we had disease issues on it last year. A bed of greenery. All of this is slowly but surely coming back to life and it, it won't be long. It won't be long till I'm picking buckets and buckets of flowers again. I love, I love spring flowers. They're, they're one of my favorite, favorite times in the garden for personal gardening for me. Uh, you know, you always, you miss them so much over the winter. So when they first come up and they first bloom, it's, it's really exciting. And one of my favorite spring flowers is blooming right now. This is my little hellebore patch. We do not have very much shade on the farm. One of the few shady spots is under this tree up near the house. And so I've utilized it to put in as many, as many hellebores as I can. Uh, this is my absolute favorite with the variegated color and the double, um, but it has some just classic purples um, and, and a few, few others here and there. The, the hellebores are perfect for me because at this phase I get to really enjoy them in the farm and then as they mature and they develop and the seed the seed pods kind of develop on them then the vase life gets really good and the flower quality doesn't really diminish too much so I get to enjoy these for a month and then come Mother's Day I come in here and I pick out almost every single flower and I sell them in mixed Mother Day bouquets and so I get to enjoy them and sell them. It's like perfect world for me. I think I've teased you for long enough. I think it's time to go check out the tulips because they're very exciting right now. The way that we've been growing our tulips for cut flowers over the last two years now, I guess, is in raised beds. I really am not a huge fan of raised beds, but they work pretty amazingly for the tulips. Because we grow the tulips in pure compost, um, they lift out very easily. They're a lot cleaner. They're a lot easier to take care of, um, but we have voles. So the raised beds protect the size. They lift them up. Um, we have a hardware cloth mesh on the bottom so nothing can dig up into it and it seems to have worked yet again. This is the bed that we planted last year. I think this bed here has about 6,500 tulips in it and there's no holes, there's no gaps. No pests got in there and ate our very expensive investment. So now I just need to keep it watered and be patient, but some of them are getting pretty close. This is actually our earliest blooming variety on the farm. This is Exotic Emperor, and honestly, it blooms about two weeks earlier than any of our other tulips. I really like it because it blooms pretty similar time to when the daffodils are blooming, and it's this nice green and white variegated. Um, it's fragrant, it opens up, it's a double, it's really beautiful, and it pairs really well with them. So these, like, I mean, this one's ready. <laughs> honestly, this week, I'm probably gonna be picking out most of this variety in here. Um, feels insane. <laughs> Ian and I were talking. It's it's a little it's a little early. It's it, nerve wrackingly early this year because it's still it's more than four weeks till Mother's Day, and we grow so many tulips because we want them specifically for Mother's Day. 
tulips do store we do have you know some flexibility with them that way um but i don't i don't think we're going to be having exotic emperor as a mother's day offering this year and then beside our main bed we have two other beds which are our leftovers from last year last year we had an insane heat wave it was very very stressful the tulips blew open faster than we could keep up with we actually had a lot of loss and what we did to try to recoup it is we just left them we were like okay whatever they'll be back next year so it's exciting to see that stuff actually is coming up and honestly if anything some of these are a little bit earlier than the varieties that got planted in the fall because they are you know the same kind of colors and everything that we already grow I eyeballing it right now I think there's probably three to four thousand tulips just in these two beds um, so I don't know it's exciting we'll see fingers crossed we can sell them all that isn't where the tulips end though we still have two more mini raised beds that we filled up we had some left over we threw them into these crates uh, we we bought 10,000 tulips but probably one of our favorite and weirdest looking ways to grow the tulips is we actually grow them in bulb crates. So these are inside a tunnel here. The plan when we planted these in the fall was keep the tunnel open so that the moisture can come in, it can water the tulips over the winter. And then as the spring warmed up, we were gonna put the cover on and then these could have bloomed two weeks earlier. Our weather's been insane. The last thing we need is tulips to be even earlier. So we never have bothered to, to cover this up yet. Um, but yeah, no, these tulips are looking great. And the really nice thing about the tulips in the crates is they're really flexible. So if at any point in you know the next month, we want to not have these here, we can just lift up the crate and move it to a different spot if we wanted to plant inside here. The raised bed works really well, um, but it, you know, it's, it's got its limitations. These crates, I like these crates. They're expensive, they're hard to find the crates. Every year we get our bulbs in the crates, so we get a few more. Um, I could imagine if, we kept going every year every year getting more crates eventually this would be the only way we would grow tulips and another thing that lots of people have been asking me about is what is this what's going on here um, and this is a continuation of a crate experiment that we've been working on these were glads that we succession planted in crates it worked amazing the glads super dense very similar growing style to the tulips very easy to just throw them down anywhere we have space. I really, really enjoyed growing them in crates. Glads don't overwinter here. So if I was to put them in the ground, they would die. They wouldn't come back. But because they were in the crates, I didn't have to dig them up to store them inside for the winter. I just grabbed these fully planted crates, threw them inside my garage, They've been protected all winter. They actually look really nice because there's a little bit of moisture um, still left in the soil for most, most of the year. Um, and then now that we're not getting these really hard freezes overnight, which would kill off the glads, I've dragged them back out <laughs> to the farm. And now I'm gonna see, will they bloom for a second year in a row? The one thing about this is they're not gonna bloom in a staggered succession all of these crates are gonna bloom at the exact same time. So I'm gonna get a huge flush of glads if it does work out, um, but I'm also gonna buy in glads this year and then I'm gonna to continue to do the same system. So I'm the kind of the nice thing about this is that first succession of glads that I would have been planting is kind of already done. And then I have one last place where I'm growing things inside. This rack is more exciting to me than maybe to other people because what this rack of seedlings represents to me is being able to take some time off this winter. Everything on this rack is stuff that if I was to grow it myself, I would have started it in December and I really wanted to take December and January off, uh, off farm work and I was able to do it because instead of growing these myself, I bought them as plugs from Ball. 
So what I have is I have the Lysianthus. You know, this is, I've already planted out some of my Lysianthus, but I have another succession of Lysianthus seedlings that come beautiful. You know, they come to me and then I just instantly put them out. It's so easy. We have also got a bunch of delphiniums this year that we're trying out. Um, this, I, like, I don't even know. I don't even know if I would have been able to grow delphiniums. I've heard they can be a tricky seedling to grow. And then the worst, the worst offender of all, eucalyptus. These are such divas. I've tried growing them before and I fail miserably at it. I ordered in a bunch of eucalyptus plugs and I've potted them up. These came in, I think, end of February. So they've been growing on a little bit. I think by the time, you know, mid-May rolls around, you know, another five weeks from now, these are gonna, you know, be nice, healthy plants that I can either plant out in the farm, in the heat where they like it, or uh, sell as seedlings to local people because eucalyptus is hard to find, but desirable. Another thing that I'm excited to experiment with for selling retail plants instead of just cut flowers is the Lysianthus. They are like the eucalyptus, they're really hard to find, but really desirable. People are starting to recognize these things and they want to grow them themselves. So every single tray of Lysianthus that I got in, I actually potted up an entire 72 tray of it so that I can, you know, probably in a few weeks from now, because these are getting pretty big. I'm starting to see roots in the bottom. Let's see, oh, look at that. They're growing so good. I'm going to pot these up into like a two and a half inch pot and then I'm gonna sell them for people to be able to try having them in their home garden. Um, so it'll, it'll be fun to see, be fun to see if these are, are a desirable plant for people to buy. And then in here are my seedlings that I, I really need to start hardening off. I need to start getting a workflow here um, and starting some of the warmer summer crops and getting these outside and established. So I have some snapdragons. I'm really happy with how these are looking. Last year, we didn't have snapdragons. I messed up snapdragons really, really badly. And my biggest lesson that I learned is I don't actually need snapdragons. We did completely fine without snapdragons. But doesn't mean I don't still want them. So, so I am excited to, to see these growing. You know, some of these varieties, look at that, right? You know. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how those look. It's gonna be lots of snapdragons. And then uh, I have some feverfew, which is good. <laughs> These need to get out uh, because my feverfew, as I was saying, you know, is looking like I lost most of it this winter. So I'll be glad to have some to fill in. And then I have um, one, six, six different colors of status. We love status here. It's, it's great dried, but the truth is we, I think we use even more of it fresh. Um, I, I grew a lot of status last year and I needed more. I found that I was running out of it. I think we had three beds of status in total. Um, so on this shelf, I have three beds of status. And then I also have an entire bed of winged everlasting, which we use in a similar way. And I'm supposed to have two more trays of status coming to us from, from Ball. So it's like five beds. <laughs> so this year, this year I should have enough. I, I should be able to never run out, have a hoard of it, maybe even have some extra for drying. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful and versatile plant. Highly recommended. Winter is always really hard for me. It's very gray here in the Okanagan over the winter. And I spend, I spend so much of my life outside with plants in the dirt. Um, it always feels way too long <laughs> until I'm back at it. So having these flowers, having these seedlings, having things waking up outside in the earth you know, it makes me feel like I'm waking up too. Um, there's a lot of work ahead of me, uh, but at this time of year, it's just always, it always just feels exciting and fun. So I hope you guys have enjoyed seeing all the flowers and everything too. It's 
only gonna get brighter as the months go on. Thanks again to our sponsor, Squarespace. One of the things that I know we're really doing wrong in our business is we're not taking advantage of marketing in the way that we should be. We need to get our name out there because if people don't know we exist, they don't know how to buy from us. And one of the best ways you can do that is with a website and Squarespace can help. Squarespace is the ultimate platform for creating your dream website. With flexible business templates, you can start with professional design that fits your category and customize it to match your unique style. Be it a professional blog, a portfolio, or a business website, Squarespace ensures your online presence stands out on every device. But it's not just about being seen. It's a great way to sell. Whether you're selling physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace provides you with the tools you need to launch your online store effortlessly. From inventory management to secure payment processing, Squarespace has got you covered. And if, like me, you also sell in person, Squarespace offers point-of-sale integration. Connect a Square Reader to the Squarespace app and sync your orders, inventory, and customer data with your online store, making it easy to carry your business anywhere. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash you can eat the grass to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.